family team's all set, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Before I open the hearing for the Constable Conservation Commission, I would like to ask George to do a roll call for the for purpose. Abadili? Present. Foster? I don't see her yet. Gilmore? Present. Herm? Present. Lee? Present. Morin? Present. Dan Poo is not here yet either. We did, um, let's see, Administrator Darcy Carley? Present. Yeah, member Kim Kavanaugh. Present. Agent Ed Hoops. Present. Uh, we have a quorum, Mr. Chairman. The floor is yours. Thank you. Acting under the provisions of Mad General Law, Chapter 130, Section 40, and or Chapter 237 of the Code of Town of Barnstable, the Barnstable Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, February the 7th, 2023, at 3 p.m. on the application of Pamela Ryden, Joseph e. Joseph T. Marat, the hearing will be held remotely as televised on Channel 18. The events and application are on file and may be reviewed by scheduling appointments by sending email requests to Darcy Curley at 2.30 South Street, Hyannis. This meeting is being recorded and transmitted by the Information Technology Department of the Town of Ansible on Channel 18. Under Mass General Law, Chapter 38, Section 20, Anyone else desiring to make such recording or transmissions, please let Channel 18 or I know. Hearing not, this afternoon's hearing agenda is posted on the town's website. The, on the agenda, next to each application is the amount owned to the town of Anstable for the cost of advertisement. Please send your checks to Conservation Division at 2.30 South Street before the hearing. Remote participations. The Conservation Commission's public com public hearing will be held by remote participation as a, as a result of an act extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency as signed by the Lieutenant Governor on July 16, 2022, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Remote public access to this hearing shall be provided in the following manner. One, the hearing will be televised by Channel 18. Second, the Commission utilize the Zoom link 8752414847 -84 or use the toll free phone number 8884754499 as song on the agenda. Third, the public can also email their comments to darcy.curly at town.bonstable.ma.us at least eight hours prior to the hearing. Um, before I start the hearing, I mention, want to mention that the upcoming MACC annual conference information is available. The conference is scheduled between February the 28th and March the 9th. For the commissioner who want to attend, please let her know so that uh, she can make arrangements. And this is a remote meeting for all the sessions. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chair, I just would uh, like to say that uh, Commissioner Foster has joined us at 3.02. Okay, thanks. Under the old new business, the first item, Dawn Lawson to present the end of reports from Austin Spills Community Garden. Welcome, Donna. You're muted, Donna. Donna, can you unmute yourself? Donna, you're yes, sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Donna Lawson. I'm here representing the Garden Committee from Long Pond Conservation Area Community Gardens. We sent a financial report to Ed Hoops. I believe you have a copy. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer it. Any questions from the commissioner? And here's your report on the on the screen right now. Yes. Do you have anything that news for us to be uh, to know? Because it looks like you know, you know you have a heavy balance in terms of budget stuff. Manage. Do. do you have any problems? Right now, um, I was in the garden this morning with the irrigation company. Our um, irrigation hose has is sticking out of the ground right now, and it will need to be repaired 
before our season starts. So that will um, eat up some of that money. They will do it um, probably mid-April. Yeah. I'm going to have yeah. to dig it further into the ground. Yes, they do. But we need to have some type of balance just in case something does happen to our irrigation system. Right, right. No, especially when you have that cold weather on that weekend. Yes, week, yes. It might cause some damage to the irrigation piping if, they, if you're exposed at all, getting too close to the ground. So Yes. Any question from the commissioner? I've got my hand up, Tom. Hey, Larry? Uh, hi, Donna, how are you? I'm well, thank you, Larry. How are you? Well, at least your, your raspy voice tells me that you've been singing a lot. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, it says at the top that you've welcomed 14 residents. Is those new, resi new, uh, new residents or how many that people? That was last year, yes. Just last four, year. Just 14, the low number, or has that been the traditional number? Mm, that was higher last year. Really? Okay. Yes. All right. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to have a full garden this year. We only have five plots available for the 23 season. Okay. All right. And do you have any, uh, uh, obviously in the wintertime, you're not going to have had any vandalism issues, but was there any carryover from last year that, that wasn't no. accounted for? We had no issues at all last year, none. Okay, that's very good. Okay, well, thanks a lot. And best of luck. I enjoyed my time there. Thank you. Back almost 20 years ago now, but I enjoyed it nonetheless. Thanks. We enjoyed having you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Any more comments from the commissioner? Thank you, Donna. You're welcome, Chairman Lee. Thank you. See you next, next year. Yes, thank you. Um, next item is supposed to be Sage in terms of the presentations, but I want to hold it off a little bit until Peak shows up because he is interested to listen to the presentations. So I want to go to the revised plan. It's the 27 Winfield Link Realty Trust, SC3-5889. John. Catching me off guard here. Uh, John O'Day Sullivan Engineering Consulting. I'm representing the applicants. Uh, I'll pull up a plan that was submitted. Um, give me one second. Uh, this is a property that, sorry, it's coming. Zoom buttons are always right in the way where I need to press. Yeah, wait. There we go. Ah, here we go. Got up now. Sorry about that. Uh, so this is a redevelopment uh, that is underway. Um, prior to that, over the course of many, many years, there was uh, multi-owner restoration of the wet meadow field that exists between this and wet and uh, West Bay, uh, which has been very, very successful. Uh, there are two poplar trees right around the 50 foot buffer. Um, and we discussed those with staff and they felt like that was maybe more than could be handled just as maintenance work underneath the ongoing conditions of the restoration work. So it was suggested we bring this in as a revision um under this open permit um so there uh again there's two uh we believe white poplar trees they have been uh shooting their little sprouts in every direction uh and, and you know within the buffer zone and wetland they're, they're pretty well managed through the uh maintenance of the uh, restoration area and in the lawn, they're kind of managed through the mowing of the lawn. Uh, but as the site has been disturbed for the construction, it's really, they've really just taken off and spread to the point that they're out in the driveway on the other side of the house now. Uh, and we think that the, if we could remove them, it would be preferred. 
We did get a comment from staff just today looking for confirmation on the that these are in fact white poplars. Uh, I wasn't able to get anybody. We've had a lot of people over the years at this property. I wasn't able to get anyone back to the site uh, within these couple of hours, but the landscape um, architects did send along uh, did send along a photo of the trees, kind of highlighting some of the indicators uh, that are typical uh, of the white poplar being the bark and et cetera. And um, you know, if it was necessary, we could get some further confirmation before we actually proceeded, but wasn't able to do it in the short time. I would be happy to answer any questions. And I think Kim sent out that photo um, late this morning. Any question from the commissioner, Luis? He's muted. Unmute yourself, Luis. All right. Are you planning on placing those trees with anything else? Uh, I believe we did um, those to be uh, replacements in that general area. What is it? What is what, what is a tupelo? No, oh, you said tupelo in that I said area. Two, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Thank you, Bill. Apart from them being uh, potentially invasive, uh, might pop. What? Why are the trees being taken down? No reason. Except that they, as white poplar, they send out, I mean, it has nothing to do with the house or anything, but as white poplar, they rejuvenate through their sprouts and they pop up everywhere. And so, so, so it is it's just because they are white poplar, you want to Because they are white poplar. We oh, want to. okay. Thank yes. you. And they are replacing the, the two trees with the uh, poplar. No, with with any other question from the commissioner? Excuse me, Tom. Yep. Thank you. Um, I think we just want to confirm that we at least want to have three inch caliber chest height um, replacement trees. Yes. Is that okay, John? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Corrupt motion to approve this rice plan with the replacement tree with the tupelo, three inch di diameter tupelo. So, that's it. Aye. Foster. Aye. One more aye. Earn. Aye. Lee. Aye. Warren. Aye. That's your name, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peak is not with us right now, right? I'm sorry. I don't see oh, B. I don't see B yet, please. So let's go to the extension request. The first one with zero severe role real trust. SC3-5794. This is his first request. John? I just John Dave from Sullivan Engineering Consulting. This was for a uh, single family dwelling on a vacant piece of land outside of the 50 foot buffer, and no work has been done. And this is a first request. And we usually approve the first request on the extension request. Um, could I have a motion to approve the extension request? Second. Roll call. Foster. Aye. Warren. Aye. Lee. Aye. Abadili. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. That's unanimous, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Second extension request is Michael Ose and SC3 that's five six five one, and this is for Eleven Bay Avenue. Uh, SC3, yeah five six five one. John, uh, yes, this, this was a project that was partially um, constructing a boardwalk and some landscaping, uh, and then there was also a aspect of it which was some restoration in the buffer zones and restoration in the wetland area. All the construction landscaping work is done. Restoration work in the buffer zone was done. 
uh, and the property has transferred and the new owners uh, are looking forward to continuing those efforts into into the wetland area and hope that this is uh, extended. And the two abutting parcels actually have separate um, restoration areas in their wetlands. And so hopefully this becomes one large, nice restored wetland. And this is the first request. Well, questions from the commissioner, anyone? Got a motion to approve the extension request. So moved. Second. Second. Oh, roll call. Uh, there's Pete. Um, just for the record, Peter is now Pete Sam, who is uh, not with us. So I will ask uh, Commissioner Sam. Aye. Morin. Aye. Lee. Aye. Burn. Aye. No more aye. Foster. Aye. Abili. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Going back to the old and new business, the second item, see progress. Second, director Bonsta looks at water coalitions. Informal discussions on water quality research for two bullet points. Z. Hey, everybody. I want to thank the commission for having me. Uh, I'm going to run through some slides very quickly. Uh, I view this is uh, probably the first of an ongoing conversation that we'll have uh, over time. And it's mainly meant to update uh, everybody on what we're learning from Shubhan and the work we're doing there. But I want to put it into context uh, and, and mention how we, as a nonprofit organization, uh, view what the uh, commission may be able to do. So um, the headline uh, you'll see there, uh, using your authority to save the bays. Let's go to the second slide, please. So, you know, I think that everybody knows what's going on in the bays, but this is data taken from uh, last August looking at the conditions of the bays which have never been worse, sadly. Uh, dissolved oxygen uh, in red really shows the kind of conditions we're facing. I think everybody knows this. It's not really new news, but you may not know just how serious uh, the characterization is here uh, and the kind of deterioration we're seeing in the bays. Uh, we believe that these conditions would have been significantly worse if it hadn't been a serious drought. Uh, so more water, more rainwater would have moved uh, groundwater into the bays more quickly and been more problematic. Let's go to the next slide, please. So the baseline here, but I think this is a great image for everybody to get on board. This is all of the uh, all of the municipal treatment on Cape Cod is marked here in black. Uh, not much, um, hardly any, really, when you look at it. Um, and, and that's really the problem, I think, not just for uh, the three bays watershed, which is the third worst, but the rest of the very troubled uh, watersheds and estuaries here on Cape Cod. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, I think everybody here knows the kind of things we're working on, really two things, alternative septic system technology that we'll talk about. And also we'll be before you hopefully soon to talk about the restoration of uh, over 100 acres of cranberry bogs at the headwaters of the Marsons Mills River. And, and just to remind everybody, the Marsons Mills River carries about 40% of the excess load that goes into the three bays estuary. Uh, and that's by work done by the Mass Estuaries Project uh, and the late Dr. Brian House. Uh, it's not from the cranberry box. They're really just a natural collection system for groundwater. Let's go to the next slide. We've got a lot of partners here. We consider you guys partners, the town of Barnstable, clearly a partner here, um, the US EPA, the US Geological <laughs> Survey. Uh, and many others uh, that, you know, we won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, it will be available to all of you. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, the work that we're doing uh, in box is particularly important. And I'm very pleased to say that before long, we're going to be in front of you looking for conservation restriction uh, work um, on the box. We have a couple of agreements in hand now, and we actually have uh, a new news on a potential state grant, which would provide us with the uh, uh, a fair amount of money to purchase uh, more of the bog related lands. And, and as a reminder, again, we're not looking to put uh, cranberry farmers out of business, uh, but the cranberry business has become very, very difficult. Uh, climate change is very difficult without a hard, uh, lengthy, uh, cold weather and without or with too much heat uh, is very difficult for farmers to continue to maintain um, their efforts. Let's go to the next slide. Shubal Pond is an area that was identified by the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. EPA as an area to test out the alternative septic system technology we're going to talk 
talking about today. I think everybody knows where Shubal is. We have identified there. You can see in the left-hand photograph um, a harmful algal bloom that occurred in 2020. Uh, that year and a few other years, the pond's been closed. Um, certainly, phosphorus is a big part of the problem, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, but the conventional uh, latest wisdom out of the EPA is, is the combination of both nitrogen uh, and phosphorus, both coming from our septic systems that are the big problem. Let's go to the next slide. You may have this loaded in some different series. We sent you a big file, but if we can go to the next slide. I think it's because we're waiting to admit somebody. I can't move the slides forward. Okay. Yeah, Kim sent out four different packages in terms of these slides. The file was too big. So um, hold, on, hold on, please, one second. Can I see that? No, we can't see anything yet. Okay, hold on, please. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Here's uh, here's Shubal Pond. Uh, what's really interesting about this, and I know uh, some uh, had some people had questions, and we did too. When we first did this work, the U.S. Geological Survey told us where the groundwater was likely to be flowing. Uh, generally on Cape Cod, you see the water flowing, the groundwater uh, from the northwest to the southeast toward the sound uh, that's at the spine of the Cape on the south side. Here, um, once we started to put in water monitoring wells, we discovered uh, that the water is actually flowing uh, from the northeast to the southwest. Uh, this was new news. So we were hoping to uh, not only do work that would help us understand the groundwater, but also help Shubal Pond. Um, subsequently, we did monitoring, and this is actually the U.S. Geological Survey that did this monitoring, using a push point um, sampling along the entire edge of the pond. This can, by the way, be done at any pond to see water, where the water is coming in and where the water is going out. It uses a temperature differential, and you can see the, uh, the hot pink purple at the top. That's where the water is flowing in. Elsewhere, the water is actually uh, leaving the pond. Let's go to the next slide. So we now have a dozen septic systems in. These are all, this is a working class neighborhood, 10,000 square foot lots, no more than three bedroom uh, homes. Um, we're looking at uh, a dozen systems in total of one kind, a nitro system by a company called Clean2. Uh, we also have one a new system that was developed uh, by the MassTech folks uh, and that went in as well. So we have a total of 13 systems. We've actually applied um, with the county for a municipal vulnerability program grant to add another 10 to 12 systems in. And that's so we can get certainty around the groundwater because that's what we're trying to measure. As part of this uh, work, everybody should know, we provided uh, the individual houses with uh, separated uh, water um, metering devices, so-called Neptune devices, where we can look at the water constantly, just the interior household water, separated from any irrigation. We can look at influent, we can look at effluent. We have uh, 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 lysimeters underneath the leaching fields. We also have a network of uh, 37 groundwater monitoring wells that are being monitored by the US EPA and the US Geological Survey. Uh, at depth, we can pretty much look at the water every few feet throughout the entire water table. We're looking not only at nitrogen and phosphorus, we're looking at contaminants of emerging concern. And the US EPA is doing all this work uh, along with MassTech, uh, the Massachusetts Alternative Septic System Test Center. Um, so they're doing all the work. We're learning a lot. We're doing this data work monthly, even though these particular systems only require quarterly monitoring. Let's go to the next slide, please. This system, many of you have seen before, um, it, it's an interesting system in that it is, uh, it is designed in a way so it can be retrofit. We think that is very important. It's also relatively low cost. Get into the cost. Two chambers, one chamber actually is an aeration chamber with limestone and plastic media recirculated with an air pump, and that provides 
nitrification. In order to denitrify, you have to first nitrify. The second section has wood chips in it, and those wood chips are a carbon source that we really use as a, a mechanism um, that allows us to fool bacteria in the absence of oxygen. They end up respirating the nitrogen, turning it into gas. As gas, it's harmless. 80% roughly of our atmosphere is nitrogen gas. It's harmless uh, in that environment. Let's go to the next slide. So here are the results uh, as of the end of December, and we have some more recent uh, results as well. A little bit of a busy chart, uh, I'll, I'll walk you through it. Uh, the blue bars show what is the load uh, that's coming in, the influent load for nitrogen in milligrams per liter. And so you'll see now what's interesting here, a couple of things. First of all, the loads are very high. Um, interestingly, the state says that for a typical three bedroom house, the load would be 45. These numbers are well above 45. We believe that the 45 is dated information and incorrect um, at scale. Um, and so you can see what the load is here. The uh, performance data, you can see in the orange bars, which is what's coming out the effluent, uh, very good numbers as a benchmark um, we believe that the municipal system is probably in the six, seven, eight range on a regular basis. So we're far better uh, generally um, than we're seeing at the municipal plant. It's a different thing. We need both. I'm all for municipal treatment, uh, but I want to point out the performance data. What does that data mean in terms of the reduction of nitrogen? So the bottom chart takes the math that we have from water usage, annualizes that data, looks at this reduction, and this is a good snapshot of just how much uh, we're reducing nitrogen. So um, the, the biggest reduction, 24 kilograms, um, that's a lot, 50 pounds a year coming out of one household. Um, so we're seeing significant reductions um, in nitrogen. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is relevant for this conversation in the following way. Um, the town of Falmouth has recently uh, performed uh, work um, putting in sewering municipal treatment around uh, Little Pond. Many of you may know Little Pond in Falmouth. It's one of the fingers that goes to the south into uh, Nantucket Sound. And what's interesting about this work, and this is again a busy slide, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. What's important is that this was done over time uh, beginning uh, in 2016. And what the aha moment for us was, when the houses closest to the water finally were put on municipal treatment sewer, uh, the loads and levels of nitrogen in the little pond water itself dropped dramatically and quickly in a matter of months. Let's go to the next slide. So we've done this same work to take a look at what could that mean if we were to encourage, uh, hopefully, ultimately mandate homes that are not going to be on municipal treatment anytime soon um, in our watershed. And I just wanted to give everybody a feel for what that could mean. And we did a couple of things here. We looked at uh, the households and we looked at their water usage. And the implication, as you can see in red, uh, just for these 100 homes, we're talking about uh, two and a half tons of, uh, of nitrogen that's being put in the bay annually. And we're looking at what could happen if we were to install alternative septic system technologies of the type I just described. So we could save 3,600 pounds. When we looked at all the bays, there's about a little bit over 500 homes that are in the immediate uh, less than 150, 200 feet. Uh, to the water around our three bays neighborhood. So potentially we could be talking about two, 22,000 uh, pounds uh, annually that could be removed if all the houses were uh, connected to alternative septic systems. And of course, many of these areas, including Katuit, uh, Oyster Harbors, uh, in my view, will never see uh, municipal treatment. It's not gonna happen in my lifetime or any of yours. We also looked at the Katuit water usage, which was very interesting and informative. It's probably what we would all expect to see. And we can see the peak. So what's interesting here, and it was part of this math that we did, about 70% of water usage occurs between 
May and September uh, in this area on Cape Cod. And obviously this is the time when we have all of our household guests, all of our family members, everybody comes now uh, in the summer and that's why we're using so much water and we're contributing such a huge load to the watershed. Let's go to the next slide. So, you know, I took a look at the Title V regulations and thought about uh, what this commission has the ability to do. And uh, the rule that you're all very familiar with, 310 CMR, um, actually looks like it says, okay, you're, you're just within 100 feet is where your real responsibility is. However, uh, the ruling and regulation goes on to state it can be a greater distance than 100 feet and you could require more stringent local ordinance and, and by law or regulation. And, and that characterization comes from the presumption um, that you can overcome the 100 feet with credible evidence uh, from competent sources uh, that compliance will not, will not protect unless we, uh, in fact, look a little further from the water. I think that uh, evidence is available um, you know, in spades. Let's, let's go to the next slide. So what I would uh, suggest over time, and I would love for uh, this commission to consider are ways to encourage people to put these systems in and actually dramatically impact um, our bays. Our bays are close to eutrophic. Besides the work that I showed you earlier, we've had the US EPA uh, do significant benthic survey work. I have all the data, I have all the reports for you to look at. Um, and the muck that's being collected in our bays collectively, particularly in the three bays, is so evident and so clear and so toxic. And what is that muck? That muck is just dead algae. The algae is building up every year. Um, it's dying and it's creating a mucky bottom where nothing almost can live. So shellfish beds that used to exist, they're gone. Um, not everywhere, but a lot of them are simply gone. And so uh, my argument would be, if we can motivate people to do the right thing, and you um, as a commission have the tool to do that, you could agree to uh, various things, a view corridor, uh, more lawn. Lawns, by the way, remove about 85% uh, of, uh, of the nitrogen that's put on them. I, I, I would lobby for, and, and I don't know if you guys have the ability to, uh, in fact, um, ban fertilizer use uh, along the water. I'd encourage that. I think it should be banned. Um, but other levers that you have, I hear all the time. I was on looking at a chicken coop. Eight bedroom home on Oyster Harbors. You know, that person and my belief, don't know them personally, could easily afford one of these systems and make an enormous difference. Um, and a chicken coop uh, would be an easy trade, in my view, to get uh, this kind of technology in the ground being used now uh, and not uh, decades from now. We actually need this work now. One of the things we're very passionate about here is climate change is becoming a force multiplier. And by that, I mean, uh, as the temperature rises, as we add things to water and turn up the heat, uh, the algal blooms are going to become more significant uh, and, more, um, and more difficult to handle over time. Let's go to the next slide. So the, uh, the work that's being done for the new DEP regulations uh, is coming along. You guys have probably looked at this. Uh, it's, uh, I had a lot of comment periods. We'll see what actually comes to pass. But we all know the areas that are involved, so I wanted to point it out. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, we're passionate about making these changes as soon as possible. Um, spending time with Dr. Brian Hanhouse, uh, he essentially agreed that a great approach would be to work back from the water, even while we look at putting in municipal treatment in the spine and in the interior areas. And why is that so critical? Time to travel is the main issue here. So uh, groundwater moves between one and four feet a day on Cape Cod, more in the rainy season, more when it's raining. So while municipal treatment is terrific and we have to do it, uh, a lot of areas where we're looking at putting in sewering, actually the groundwater is so loaded right now, the change won't actually show up for decades after the sewer is put in. And, and so we're really chasing a problem that's only gonna get worse, where um, again, my belief is uh, you all have the ability to help institute a change that could actually make a material difference. Let's go to the next slide. 
Uh, some people have said, well, we really can't use these uh, systems. They're not all approved. But in fact, the proposed regulations, I wanted to point this out, uh, that are being put out by MassDEP uh, provide for usage of provisional and pilot systems. The system that I described is a uh, provisionally approved system. Uh, it's relatively low cost. Let's go to the next slide. We'll look at the cost. Um, relatively low cost. I believe that we need financial help with this. Okay, I'm not saying that everybody can take this on, although I do believe that many people on the water could easily afford uh, these kind of numbers. And without um, uh, motivation, people won't do it. A fellow uh, down the street here built a home recently, um, and he had called me and said, this is great. I'm going to put one of these systems in. It's terrific. Paid two and a half million dollars for the lot. Built the house. It's probably three and a half million dollars. Had designed in uh, one of the alternative septic systems. Called me up and said, I'm sorry. I can't afford it anymore. I can't afford it. Uh, I can't do it. We'll go back and put in a Title V system. I got to save those fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Okay. And so now we've got a five bedroom house that's gonna pollute for the next 30 years. Uh, it's right on North Bay. It happens to be on a road where we've actually sampled the groundwater. The groundwater currently uh, has over 11 milligrams of nitrogen in the groundwater itself. I can tell you from looking at the data that I have from the water wells uh, from the 1960s that the background data should be around a 0 0.05 or less. Uh, that's how much nitrogen should be in the groundwater. We're just polluting these bays to death. It's unbelievable. Uh, let's go to the next slide. That's really it. Um, happy to entertain any questions. You guys are good to take the time. I know it's not an easy conversation. You can't just hit a switch and do it. Uh, but I really believe uh, we all have, uh, you know, an ability to make changes here that could uh, help uh, save the bays that, that that we love so dearly. So thank you. Thank you, Seek. Any questions from the commissioner on this information? What? Bill. Somebody say in the Bill? Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Z. That was very helpful. As I think about, I mean, how our commission would actually enact that kind of requirement, we use my head sort of spinning. And having been here only a relatively short time, I don't know how we would do that, but I, I'm thinking an ordinance, if we had an ordinance, and we'd have to work out that ordinance. And here we have Z, he says, oh, we, gotta, we should do something. And I support that suggestion. Can we, I guess I'm addressing Tom, or I guess I'm addressing Tom, can we have some kind of a, a session where we can talk about this, potentially talk about an ordinance or how do we deal with that? Because I, I don't know that, you know, this is the time and the place to actually get onto it. We've listened to Z and yeah, oh, nice presentation, Z, and then go home, go away, and then we don't do anything. I would love to be able to sink our teeth into this and have everybody, you know, let's, let's talk about how can we do this. That's, thank you. Thank you. I don't, have a, I don't have a sort of answers for you because when it comes into the static system that is under the Board of Health jurisdictions, how to enforce it from the conservation side, I have the trouble in terms of doing that. I think this is more of the Board of Health discussions as far as the septic upgrade or whatnot. Um, right now, you know, the town makes some comments to the DEPs as far as the proposed Title V regulations or the watershed permitting. And we are watching, I mean, from, from my perspective, I'm looking at it from the border fell side in terms of what is this new regulation coming in? How does it gonna change? And even right now, the border fell has been dealing with some of the, you know, people with fixed income, how they're gonna do that, in, even including sewer connection and so forth. So there's whole, a whole lot of holistic questions that coming out from this, this is not a simple question as far as just upgrading the septic system. So there's just a lot of discussions that need to be had and I'll be watching on it. So that's my that's my initial comments first. John. Uh, thank you. So yeah, uh, I mean, obviously all of us, especially those that, of us that sit in this commission, 
really understand the problem it's growing really understand the need to to do more i think than wait for the town sewer plan to take effect as you say as old as i am I guarantee i ain't going to be here by the time it gets really effective so we all agree that there's there's a there's a real problem and that there's going to be some solutions to it but i have a couple of questions first if i can a very specific one a few weeks back in an application and god forgive me i can't remember what it was but there was evidence submitted or testimony submitted that said well we really do not know the impact of nitrogen on chewable pond because the groundwater is not flowing into it as you pointed out on one of your charts so we don't understand or we don't have any evidence relative to the nitrogen impact of chewable pond with these new systems because of the groundwater flow so that's my first question can you kind of explain that to me you know shul was selected because of the groundwater uh conditions which are very high between 7 and 11 milligrams in a neighborhood the San Torres neighborhood so that was targeted because what we wanted to see in the end was how much changes given what i illustrated to you uh, 90 to 95 milligrams going into a septic tank um now that's no doubt what's going into a title five system as well uh there, there's some math and assumptions about what comes out but we know the groundwater is 7 to 11. so the question really is that we're trying to answer here with the uh, work the pilot work that we're doing at Shul is um the scientists say if we see systems performing at the kind of level that I described that we're seeing Shubal. Groundwater levels of nitrogen should go down from 7 to 11 milligrams to perhaps below 1. Mm. Now, if we get below 1, that has huge implications for uh, Cape Cod at large for groundwater. And that's really the work that we're trying to do and identify. Within Shubal, um, we have been hopeful uh, that the ground it was flowing in a different direction by the time we did the work and understood everything as i described that wasn't the case even though we were using the u.s geological survey the smartest people in the world are water flow um we know that um we're looking at a balance of phosphorus and nitrogen and, and it could be uh that uh that phosphorus um is we know it is a problem within shubal and i know there are plans and they before you to look at an alum treatment which you know, help solve the problem. I'm not convinced that alum is the longer term uh, success story. I can tell you, however, uh, that there uh, is new technology coming along, very interesting technology uh, that could introduce alum um, into uh, the wastewater flow actually for a septic tank. And that, that could be a put in on a dose basis and actually remove the phosphorus before it hits the tank, before it gets into the ground. Mm -hmm. More work needs to be done here, John. This is critically important work. Phosphorus is hugely uh, complicated, uh, and, and Schubel is very complicated. When I spend mm -hmm. time with uh, the scientists, they say, we're just not sure where the phosphorus is actually coming from. And the issue there is that um, our uh, ground areas, our sandy soils, are loaded with both iron and magnesium, and phosphorus binds to those elements very quickly. Uh, so the work that was done at the joint base over the last 30 years indicated that groundwater that's loaded with phosphorus won't travel very far uh, before it gets bound up. So it could be other things. It could be stormwater is a much bigger contributor um, to the phosphorus problem at Shubal and other ponds than we currently understand. We're stopping to look at some of that work it's really important work uh, not just on cape cod but nationally so you know the balance of phosphorus and nitrogen critical understanding how that works critical understanding what's going on in the groundwater which is so difficult to track groundwater is notoriously complicated it's just hard to figure out okay it's kind of a, a follow-up question um, sure. i know we have and i think you've been involved with this um Marcel clean water has been involved with putting in some of these alternative systems in saltwater situations, homes on the salt, you know, that are on the base. Yeah. Um, have you, do you have numbers from those locations to show us the impact of nitrogen flow before and after? 
No, and that's why we're doing the shoe work because everything is consolidated within a very small area. And so because groundwater is so tricky, it's actually a benefit to us that we're on a chewable pond and the pond water is actually flowing out. And that water can be identified by the scientists as being specific to that pond by temperature and by isotope. So to track that is how we're trying to look at what happens, not just when you do one house, but when you do many houses, because to try to track one septic system to plume on the water is hugely complicated and fraught with, with uh, conditions that could mean you look at good data. So that's why we're trying to put in an additional dozen systems. And once we have that, then we really ring fence where the, where, where the water could be coming from. We know it's wastewater. Uh, we can test for that. We understand what's there. We're finding pharmaceuticals and household products. We find caffeine. That's one of the key things that you look for. Uh, we find other elements, uh, sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, so we know what's there. And so that's that's why the work that we're doing, I think, is so interesting. It's going to inform us about what's going on in the coastline. By the way, we know everything. And so one of the things about these systems, it's an important question to answer is, how quickly will they start operating at a very high performance level for people who are only seasonal residents. Uh, we think it's going to be relatively quickly, but thinking is not knowing, and so we're going to get data. And we actually have um, a system that's been designed by a group at Stonebrook University that can measure uh, nitrogen um, at any frequency that we want. So we have two systems in the ground looking. We can do it hourly if we want. So that is going to provide us over time with information about, okay, these people were on all winter. They just back how quickly is that system up and operating we need to know that support i think that's a really valid really important kind of a piece of, of sure. evidence that you need. just changing subjects a little bit and you know I, I guess the issue that tom was saying so my question is have you presented this to the board of health uh, have you made this kind of a presentation to them what kind of feedback they have secondly have you considered or have you in fact done something before the town council because I think Bill started to hit on this. I mean, clearly it seems to me there's a lot of, you're going to get a lot of political kickback and feedback against this and some for it, certainly. I hope. Um, so you, you're probably going up to a town ordinance more than a conservation commission regulation. I suspect legally and politically that would probably be the stronger way to go. We, we have in the past, um, recently, since we become involved actually with what you're doing we have in fact promoted these systems but we do not have the legal authority yet to force these legal systems that force these alternative systems so i would think you want to consider going to the town council looking more for um, ordinance than conservation commission i think you may be legally a sounder approach uh, second concern would be you know i would ask Actually, I don't know if we could ever do this, but homes that you designated, though, what would you say? They were 200 homes or some number along the chart you showed along the Tour Bay and North Bay. How many of those, in fact, would come before us over the next 10 years where even if we could mandate, uh, it would happen? So that's kind of a practical question. Really good, really good points, John. And I, you know, I'm not suggesting uh, that this commission a mandate. What I'm suggesting is that you may have a tool uh, to encourage, a yeah. tool where you could say, hey, we really don't want to give you a permanent dock. But I'll tell you what, I'll give you a permanent dock in exchange for your temporary dock if you put these systems in. It's in the then. I know that's maybe, I mean, maybe not that simple, but many people um, who have a lot of money would be happy to do that. And every little bit can help. And so that's the way I'm thinking about this is, is if every little bit can help, if somebody wanted to take five trees down for a view corridor, ordinarily this commission would say, there's no way I'm going to let you do that. But I'll tell you what, if you put one of these in your eight-bedroom house, um, okay, you know what, you can have your view corridor. Congratulations. And but so but that, you can see, obviously, there's a, there's a, a kind of quid pro quo with this. There's going to be a lot of shell fishermen that may not. I, know, that may take, I don't know. I'm just pretending. But we're going to save the shell. There are multiple, multiple sides to, to the issue. 
issue, obviously. Yes, um, that, I have to be confirmed. That's, that's what I really think. I mean, you know, the town has issued zoning uh, ordinances where, they, where they've created no docks are going to be placed in this area, you know. Um, and, the town, and that's why I'm saying the town council has that authority. And, and the docks may not be a solution to every case. Yeah. Just, I mean, there are different levels that we all have. We have different levers. You know, we all have to do something. This is an all hands on deck situation. So we've all been kicking the can collectively for a long time, all my life, down the road, and now we can see what happens. So we have to do something. And so it may mean that we have to think outside the box. That's the point. I was to comment that the other commissioners are attacking. Uh, the work you're doing and the positions you're taking uh, are, are just marvelous. Don't slow down. So you keep going. Yeah, I will. And we're going to be in front of the town council. And we will be in front of uh, the board of health, which I've been in many times. Other on probably late spring, we have a full year of data and more information. And uh, we're going to do that. It's a, it's a really important suggestion. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, George? Yeah, I'm kind of pulled over my thunder here, but uh, um, uh, I agree very much wholeheartedly see that uh, this is something we really can't wait on. Um, it's been kicked down the road way too long, way too long. Um, and uh, in answer to John's question, uh, as far as salt water goes, I think that Falmouth study, is a great example of, of what these systems can do around salt water and in a very almost instantaneous factor. So uh, I think- Roger, I thought that wasn't, were those sewers or were those alternative systems? Sewers, but we're close. Yeah. Same, okay. Same, okay. Same thing, really. Same, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's really, really important to, uh, to move ahead as quickly as possible. And given that, um, you know, I, I wonder if maybe we want to have a formal subcommittee or something with, uh, with some commissioners and maybe kick around some ideas about what mitigation we might consider um, and how we might do it and, and with Darcy's um, assistance along the way and, and how we could do it. And uh, maybe it would be a good idea to get this thing rolling a little bit better from our, from our just from our standpoint. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks, thank you, John. How are you doing? Larry? Uh, thank you. Uh, Z, I've uh, got a couple of quick questions for you, and then I'm going to take it a little further. Um, have you uh, – you said you are going to go to town council. Let me let me make it a broader uh, broader scope at the moment. Uh, are your, is your focus just on the town of Barnstable, or does it go beyond that? Are you, are you communicating with other towns on the Cape and their issues, or is that something that would be imposing too much upon you? No, no, we're working with many other towns. I was Barnstable Open Water uh, Coalition, Barnstable the County, too. Um, it ha happens that we're working in the three days watershed because it happens to be a relatively small, 12,500 acres, are quite troubled, um, and, and may have the ability for us to learn what are the tools that are going to work to actually make changes? The opportunity to do the um, restoration of the cranberry box, as I said, 40% uh, of the excess load gets from uh, the headwaters uh, four and a half miles away uh, into a Warren Co., Princess Co., North Bay in eight hours. If we can uh, restore those wetlands, we can reduce that load dramatically. It may actually change the conditions in our lifetime in North Bay. How about that? North Bay is a smelly, stinky, disgusting mess. The bottom is dead. It's horrible. Uh, these other things that we're talking about are going to take uh, time. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, uh, no, you know, we're looking at uh, at other areas uh, to go, Larry, um, uh, not just here. We're working with Wellfleet. We've got a conversation with them. They're looking at using um, 80 to 90 percent and alternative septic systems to deal with their comprehensive water management plan. It could be the first one approved by the state at that level. You know, we'll see. Stay tuned. That's a work in process. Okay. The, the other thing, and, and it's, hard to, it's hard for me to be keeping track of my own mind at this point because I'm familiar with your message, and I know where the other commissioners are chiming in. Um, the, the thought that I, that I have deals with um, – what the commission can do. 
uh, and what the uh, the concept of uh, of leadership and, and and George pointed out getting on it quickly. I'd rather focus on getting on it steadily. I think rather than just doing it and try to rush. I think a steady a steady plan of dialogue uh, is much more important because there's going to be transitions and changes. There's going to be changes within the commission. It's inevitable. Plus, when town council comes up for their election in September, all seats are wide open. It's they said it's the uh, decade situation that they do, and and so we're going to be dealing with new candidates, and maybe that's those are the kind of people that we should be communicating with. And I think that we should not limit it just to health department issues. I think that we have a valuable role in taking a leadership position, the leadership position being not to tell other boards what to do, not to tell them how it should be done, not to be focused just on scientists and engineers, but just saying it's in the in the, the hearing, but the DEP hearing, about, was it about two months ago? Was that when it was the, yeah. uh, that was, that was, cataclysmic that was very very controversial and there were very many issues that were brought up that need need temperance it needs communication that's been lacking and i think that the bringing in some new people whether it's within the commission or bringing it uh, within the community is the way to go uh, i think if we do that we're going to come in and be able to speak clearly on the topic uh and and incorporate your lead, your guidance and your leadership, but also uh, be respectful of others, but also try to get everybody focused. There is no focus. Uh, you, you have more of a focus, um, and uh, I see you've got glasses on, so do I, uh, but that being the case, those are my thoughts on it. Uh, I'm not a scientist. Uh, uh, whatever I am is not relevant. What it is is that how we get this problem going with a, a consensus that we're all moving uh, focusing on the things, trying to establish priorities and go from there. So I hope that that's something that makes sense to you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. So, Z, thank you so very much uh, for the analysis and the data collection. My students, when they look up eutrophication of our coastal environments around the country now, they hit first on the Cape Cod work that you all are doing. So I'm pretty thrilled to be on the a resident here and on the Conservation Commission. Some clarifying questions, please. Um, you saw that the biggest effect of septic system pollution of our coastal waters was with close proximity of that home to the water, correct? outside the Marshall's mill input. Well, that's what I, that's what I believe the, the evidence that's uh, been generated uh, with uh, the work that was done in the town of Falmouth shows. It shows how impactful and how quickly uh, the conditions can change. Well, that certainly makes sense because, you know, one thing that I say is solution to some pollution is dilution. So you get further away from the water and your concentration of your groundwater generally goes down. Um, second question, um, with the wood chip cheaper alternative, that, those wood chips have to be periodically changed, but again, that tends to be a fairly low cost maintenance. Yeah, that's, that's what we believe. The work that's been done using wood chips actually, again, in Falmouth, uh, work was done putting in a permeable reactive barrier in a long quiet bay and uh, those which were put in about 15 years ago and when they're in an anoxic environment they really don't deteriorate um, as they don't rot uh, we think the wood chip the last decades uh, uh 20 years or more but they can be changed and swapped out just like you would pump out your septic tank so you pump them out and put in new wood chips and you're right they don't cost very much money the beauty of the system is it is relatively low cost and the maintenance numbers are actually, uh, we think, very, very low. Uh, the sampling costs are the highest right now because uh, that's mandated by the state. What we think is these systems get approved. Um, and those numbers go down as well. Yeah, aerating is cheap and wood chips are cheap. So that combo of 
nitrification and denitrification is, is, is a great idea. One final question. Um, with our salt water environments, the three bays that you're studying, um, having the uh, eutrophied sediments increasingly going into a reduced state, more hypoxic and anoxic, that's going to release a lot more phosphorus. So nitrogen is likely, therefore, in this environment, more of a limiting nutrient than it might otherwise be in fresh waters. So your focus on nitrogen and its travel so quickly in our groundwater because of nitrate being an anion, not being held by any clay particles, um, that is the meat of the change that is to happen. And I think our Conservation Commission, if nothing else, are come out in a very strong support, Tom, of uh, forward movement on this kind of action. So Z, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Luis. You're on mute. Luis, you have to mute yourself. Thank you, Z. That was um, a very interesting and encouraging presentation. Uh, so much so that uh, I can imagine that all of us are ready to raise our hands and sign up for, for this new system. And uh, and I think, you know, we feel we all feel the sooner the better that we can get the ball rolling. That's what I've, I've heard from the comments from my my colleagues. Uh, my question is, now that we're, we're ready to roll um, and we get these systems in, is there going to be a, sort of a, oops, um, something better has come along? So my question is, are there some other systems waiting in the wings for uh, improved septic systems that are either more efficient or they're less expensive um, that are going to be coming out relatively soon uh, enough to impact the situation in a timely way or is this basically it? Well, you know, that's a really, really great important question. Louis. Thanks for asking it. Um, you know, first of all, my basic uh, philosophy here is let's not let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, the system is not perfect. No systems are perfect. There's going to be improvements. There will be other systems. Right now, there is virtually nothing on the horizon that comes close to the performance and the cost uh, that we're seeing here. Over time, I'm sure there, there will be. But uh, remember that, that the, and, and you know, I've spent time on this, as I have, the uh, uh, approval process for mass DEP and ultimately the system will get approved is you have to have a system going through a pilot phase for two years with uh, at least 12 systems operating. And uh, for an additional three years, for a total of five, you have to operate 50 systems. And that clock doesn't start running until you have all 50 in the ground. Uh, there's about 60, 65 of these systems in the ground right now. Um, unit 50 hit uh, in the middle of last summer. Uh, so we're well through uh, data. Um, uh, Mass DEP says, uh, you know, they may accelerate full approval based on um, statistically significant uh, data and information. We'll see. I have, I don't know whether that'll happen or not. And as I put uh, out there, I'm not sure that you really need to wait. Um, the systems perform at a very high level. It looks like 95% removal. Uh, that's a terrific uh, performance level, enough to make a difference. We had looked early on in the work started six or seven years ago, and no systems really uh, were performing at any level that was going to make a difference. There's a lot of fully approved systems, ironically, that are supposed to approve, go to maybe 19 uh, milligrams or so. And you know what? That just doesn't make any difference, honestly. It, it was not worth doing. And, and notwithstanding that fact, there's 3,000 of them in the Cape and Islands, and they were expensive, and they're expensive to maintain. And they have to be tested. So this is a vast improvement over those. And in fact, some of the work we're doing is to also look at what do these systems do for contaminants or emerging concerns? 
concern for pharmaceutical household products, that sort of thing. We need to understand that, and that is certainly going to improve over time, although it looks like even now these systems perform uh, equal to or perhaps uh, substantially better than municipal systems. Um, most of those are so-called circulating sludge systems, and they do very little to remove household products and a lot of the contaminants of emerging concern uh, that, that we worry about. Those, those go back into the ground really more concentrated. But it's a really good question, and, and uh, you know, my hope is that kind of like uh, the Japanese expression, uh, Kaizen, uh, that some companies look at, it should be constantly improving. So hopefully uh, this is going to change. I think, think that kind of like the cell phones in our pocket, you know, 30, 40 years ago, nobody had one. And I remember those days, as do all of us on the call. Uh, but now it's ubiquitous. And you know what? Um, I think that uh, the technology that's in our backyard, to treat our wastewater right there, put it back close to where it came from. I think that's part of the story we really didn't talk about, is if we, you know, we're stealing from our, our aquifer uh, by taking this water and pumping it to a remote location and then dumping it as if it's useless water. Uh, water is a precious uh, commodity, uh, even here on the Cape, and people don't realize that. Um, so as part of what the benefit over time, hopefully can and will be. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Bill, one last comment back to you. Okay, one last comment, although I have five, and they're going to be fast. One okay. is, Z, when you talk about Chubal, this is a, I'm, I'm critiquing you. Chubal is complicated. You right. have come and you want to help the bays. You want to essentially put in these IA systems in the houses of the bays. When you deal with Shubal, you have phosphorus. Phosphorus is what's causing problems in the lakes. Phosphorus is the limiting um, factor in the lakes, whereas nitrogen is in the ocean. So when you're getting into Shubal, it gets pretty complicated. And when you start talking about PFAS and, 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 and contaminants of emerging concern and all of that, it's kind of like, wait a second. And it becomes very, very confusing, I think. And, and, and uh, uh, John Abadili, it's like, well, you know, what, what's going on with, uh, with, with Shubal? Well, then you've got Shubal. Where's the water going? And it's complicated. We thought it was flowing in. No, it's flowing out. Very confusing. I think the real take-home message of your Shubal Pond thing, uh, research, the EPA work, is that these facilities do reduce nitrogen, period. That's the take-home message. You put them elsewhere, they are going to reduce nitrogen. That's what they do. And that's that's the good Good news, and I think when you start talking about all this other stuff, it just it, it goes over people's heads, and it's like ah. So I really think you, you got to keep it simple. And and another comment is that you brought up the, the the point that the Wetlands Protection Act actually does allow conservation commissions to look beyond the 100 foot, if in fact that particular activity that is it has the potential. To cause a problem, you have a house. Gee, I put in a thing that's going to be 100 feet away. It's a problem, and I, you know, I don't know about the legality of that, but I, I know that we we can deal with, um, for example, um, uh, with twin lines. It was the question of, well, what about the, the runoff, the whole runoff system of that facility? Even if it's over 100 feet away, we might have some jurisdiction, and that's the, that's the connection you're having. So therefore, we do. I, I suspect has some legal jurisdiction and the data, like you said, we have in states to defend in a court of law. So the question then becomes does this conservation commission have the stomach and willingness to take that one forward to an ordinance or whatever? And we're trying to, you know, deal with that. Well, you know, maybe we don't have the stomach to do that, but I do believe that the town should try to do something about that. Uh, John said, you take it, take it to the town council, and I think that if our commission were to, you know, write a letter and endorse and say hey, we need to deal with this and and try to get out front, um, I think we need, you know, we can say, oh, we have to, we have to do something. Well, what are we going to do? And George suggests that we have a subcommittee. We need to do something, and I and I'm wondering how do we do that. You know, we, we, we can't talk in a group unless it's public. 
How about a subcommittee? Can we have three people that come up with ideas that we can throw about? And I would highly endorse doing more than just listening to Z Crocker talking about it, throwing the can around, and then just going, out oh, at home. I, I think we have the legal jurisdiction to actually insist that these new, we, we uh, what, two or three new houses that we have approved. I can remember one over, it doesn't matter where, but we have approved brand new houses in that three bays area. I can think of one in particular. And, um, you know, could we have insisted? Well, then you'd end up getting a lawsuit. Then we would need to, I don't know how to fight that, but I mean, we could, I think, win a case along those lines. It would certainly be a so earth shattering uh, thing to, to do that. I, mean, I, wanna, I, I want us to do something and not just say, well, it's the public health's responsibility. Well, if public health isn't necessarily doing anything, and I feel like we should do something, and we have that authority. And can we not write letters to them, formal letters? I'm straight, we all sign go, ah, I don't know. I, help me, Tom. We have to do more than just go, oh, it's, it's not our problem. Let the public I'll do it. I don't think that's right. Thank you. So let me let me let me make a couple of comments and uh, and then I think we can, you know we should finish this off presentation off. First of all, like Bill said, you know, nitro is more of targeting the removal of nitrogen, period. It does not remove phosphorus. When it comes to phosphorus, that's a different technology that you can remove the phosphorus, which is being tested right now for several technologies. So it's very difficult to try to combine the two together in terms of removal of the phosphorus and the nitrogen together at the same time. So nitrogen, natural wise, I mean, the, nit nit the natural wise, I think at this point, I have seen it is kind of like the best IA system as far as the treatment removal goes for nitrogen is better than a lot of the IA system um, that are in the field. Based on the data that I have seen because of the either the full-time use or the part-time use or the seasonal use, the other IA system is fluctuating quite a bit in terms of the nitrogen removal. It's not as consistent as the nitro. So nitro still has a problem in terms of looking at full-time versus a seasonal, but it's much better than the other one. That's my, that's my observation. From, from my experience, you know, the other thing in terms of, you know, we did talk about whether there's some committee and stuff like that, but the Board of Health, I'm sitting on the Board of Health, I am not taking my eye off the board yet. So, you know, I am looking at this stuff from the Board of Health side. Are we coming up with some regulations? That's something that will be coming up in discussions, depending on how it moves in terms of the and then the most permitting goes. So that's my quick two cents. Um, George? Just one last real quick comment after what you just said. Tom. I still think it's important for us as a commission to look at whether we could have mitigation to encourage the use of these systems uh, or not. And I, I'm not smart enough to answer that, but that's why I just thought maybe a, a subcommittee would be a good idea. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for taking the time and listening to uh, a talk. And, and we'll be back for the conversation. And I'm always available. And uh, we will. I will be in front of uh, the Board of Health again. Tom knows that. Um, yep. I don't have a date yet, but we'll be up with more data. And we'll be back with some of the other experts from uh, the EPA and elsewhere who are happy to participate in these conversations. And and they're smarter than me. Uh, and uh, we'll also be in front of uh, the town council at some point uh, this year. So thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. Appreciate your consideration. I know you're all passionate about the bays and uh, about the uh, area of Cape Cod that we all live in and love. Thank you. That's the last comment before you go is, you know, besides the model of health, I think you should also talk to the DW because they are part of the important party in terms of all the whole town strategy-wise, as far as the CWMP and so forth. So it, you know, the DBWS is critical, so we have to keep them in hand.
it, it, you know, the law. With, uh, with Dan Santos and his team. Yes, yeah. indeed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have three enforcement orders. The first one is Graham Robert and Lisa Walter, Lisa C. Walter, 38 Washington Avenue, Austinville, Map 162, Azo 002, alterations of the buffer to a wetland resource area, Crystal Lake and, bo and bordering vegetated wetland by maintaining an unpermitted beach. This is tabled from January the 10th. So, um, Ed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, we've had some conversations with uh, Michael Schultz and John O'Day, uh, who've been working with the uh, homeowners, and I think we've uh, come to an understanding of what was and wasn't there uh, prior. So, I, I, without doing too much more, I think I uh, asked John to uh, make his presentation. It, it does look as though um, we've come to an agreement that the the um, the Beach, quote unquote, uh, was not really there. So um, I think at this point, oops, um, I think we're pretty much ready or moving very, very close to ratifying the, uh, the enforcement order. I have changed dates uh, to coincide with the time frame that, that has gone past here now. Um, but I think uh, at this point, we're looking to. Uh, either do the the uh, removal or at least uh, maybe at, at some point look for uh, some sort of permitting uh, as well in the future, but not as it's as it stands currently. So, uh, with that, I I would uh, turn it over to John and see if he has anything to to uh, add to that. Ah, uh, yes, just very briefly. Um, you may remember uh, when we were back at a meeting or two ago with Michael Schultz had a couple of affidavits from prior owners about the beach. I think that through our discussions with Ed and owners and looking at photos and looking at listening to pictures, you know, just so the commission understands, I think that the two owners ago was recollecting of, you know, a sand area along the pond edge. And then the last owner was easily recollecting the current condition of it. But there was a period of a couple of years in between those where we think that the upper sand area was added. Um, and so, you know, just, just so everyone understands, I think there was some questions last time about, wait a second, I, I trust these people. Why am I, why is their affidavits not lining up with what we're seeing? We think that there was a little window in there between like 2008, 2010, where the stuff up, up above um, may have been added, sand up above may have been added. Um, and so the new owners uh, understand that. They, um, we've been working with that and we understand what would be uh, required as a restoration of the area. Um, but we do plan to try to bring forth uh, a notice of intent to try to uh, improve that area and maybe maintain some portion uh, of the open space at some point this later this winter, early spring, but um, we know what the end result is if that for some reason does not work out. So we thank the staff and the commission for listening to us last time and giving us the time to circle back with all of the historical parties involved and, and make sure that we are all saying the same things. Thank you, John. I think Darcy has spent a lot of time trying to dig up the history and by the information um, thank you. Um, any question from the commissioner? Do we need a uh, motion to, to, uh, to support the enforcement order? Is yes. that what Ed needs at this point? It needs to be ratified, yeah. Okay. Right. If there's no questions, could I have a motion to approve the enforcement order as written, except the date for the December one to be changed? So Ed can check that date. So moved. Roll call. Aye. Foster. Elmore, aye. Hearn. Aye. Lee. Aye. Morin. Aye. Sample. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for job working with Ed. The second enforcement order is Joshua Wright Gravy, 
Burns, Gore Street, Barnstable, Map 319, Puzzle 052, alteration of the buffer to a wetland resource area, Coastal t Bank Town, non compliance with an order of conditions, failure to maintain ex effective sediment control, disturbance of site beyond construction work limit, un un unmounted, unvegetated area for more than 30 days. Ed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, this was a, a permanent project that was our uh, trying to raise and replace uh, out of 1, 111 George Street. Uh, this is the house that was in question. It, it has been uh, raised uh, during uh, that portion of the of the uh, project. Uh, things have sort of went down a little ways. Uh, this this whole area has been excavated uh, and. And there were some issues uh, with groundwater, uh, where the ground groundwater uh, water table had been penetrated, and uh, as you know all too well, for two speeds to the other to the to the, to the west, uh, the groundwater is very close, and it seeped into the hole, uh, created a rather large uh, mess, and it had been been going um, uh, uncorrected for. Uh, about a month and a half. So um, you can see the, the conditions uh, as of early, you know, early January. Uh, the whole, uh, this is the excavated hole, it is about four, three and a half, four feet deep. Uh, and the water levels are anywhere from here to almost up to, depending on how much rain and everything recently, uh, it, it is very close to, uh, to the very top of the, of the hole. Uh, that has uh, caused some uh, con some uh, pretty bad erosion problems on the south side of the of the property, uh, which is namely right here. And you can see the condition of the of the um, uh, work limit line and erosion control is now non-existent uh, and it had fallen into the hole. On the other end of it, on the north end of the, of the property, uh, again, this is excavated material here. Uh, and just on the other side of the hill is a uh, maybe maybe eight ten foot uh, area, and then it moves on to a revetment that goes down onto the beach. Um, and you can see that the uh, site has uh, degraded somewhat in terms of uh, erosion control. Uh, the erosion controls are are less and less effective all the way around, and some of that excavated material had been moved had been allowed to spill over the the uh, work limit line erosion control area into the resource area. Uh, the other concern was that we had so much water backed up behind behind that area. Uh, we had a little bit of concern as to um, whether or not there was going to be some sort of an impact uh, both to the to the surrounding properties as well as uh, as well as to the revetment itself. So uh, we did contact the homeowner. Uh, the homeowner has come through a couple of different um, contractors. Uh, we did speak to uh, Chris Kyle, <laughs> the Patriot Builders, uh, who has taken over the project. And uh, he has worked uh, very hard and uh, diligently with us to correct the situation. The enforcement order itself had asked uh, that he, they get rid of the water, which they had been working on. Uh, again, it's water. There's there's water table issues, the groundwater uh, issues as well. So uh, they are uh, in the pro they had been in the process of, of cleaning out the whole digging, getting as much of the water out as possible. Uh, they started out with trucks. Uh, that became a little inconvenient. They they couldn't really uh, keep up with that. Uh, they did uh, do some some filtering of water over the over the revetment, uh, and they finished up. Uh, I think uh, Chris is Chris is in the audience. I think uh, they he he was saying uh, earlier today that they were uh, hopefully finishing up the the last of the the draining uh, by pulling everything off again. All of this water that that you see here was being removed by by truck. They were trucking it away to. Um, to the uh, wastewater facility. So uh, they are pretty much uh, good to go. Uh, they still need to do some some um, erosion control fix, fixes over on the uh, far side of the north side of the, the property. Uh, fix the erosion control uh, area and work limit, work limit area. 
Uh, you can see uh, everything down below the revetment is uh, is good. It's all normal. Everything is fine. Um, and so, uh, what we've asked them that they're, they're they're like three quarters of the way done with the with the all of this in the any enforcement order at this point. Um, uh, really, again, what all they have to have left to do now uh, is to uh, fix up the uh, work limit lines and erosion control uh, on that, especially on that north side. So, uh, with that, um, I know uh, the property owner is there, Mr. Garvey. Uh, I, Chris Childs from Patriot Builders is here, and uh, I believe Matt Creighton from BSC is here as well. Thank you, Ed. Um, I have been kind of in touch with Ed uh, on this, this enforcement order in terms of bombing and uh, filtering it. And I, I think you know this is important because somehow the groundwater table was broken off and get into it. And I think to me, it's like you're right now you can you can pump all this water out, but you should find a structural engineer, which is maybe it's either Matt or somebody else from the homeowner side to decide how do they do the foundation. This is critical because of the table issues. So, I mean, I cannot enforce you to do it, but I think you should do it for the benefit of your so, um, I'll let I'll let Chris. Chris has been involved on this one. So, Chris, you have any comment on this? We we have I we've got a, we've engaged a um, geotechnical engineer who has evaluated the soil and is going to be advising us on what we need to do with the foundation. So that is in the works. Uh, and just in terms of getting the site cleaned up and back to you know, getting getting the uh, silt fence back in order and getting all the erosion crawl back, I think we're going to need about two weeks for that to all get done. Um, we've got to kind of work inside. We've got to get into the hole and then work work. From inside out, so we've got to get inside that hole, stabilize, take the mud that's in there now out, put stone in, and then get a machine in there and be able to work around the perimeter of the hole to get it stabilized and get the silt fence and the erosion control back in order. Thank you. Um, any question from the commissioner, Luis? I do yourself, Luis. I keep unmuting it. There's something new to me. I don't know what's going on. Um, let's see, my comment had to do with the other field control with how they're going to modify their um, building process. It doesn't happen again. But also, like, just the comment that beyond an environmental issue, I think it's a safety issue in terms of having a pool like that. Or deep, sitting around for six weeks. It's it, it, there really is a safety issue there. I think. That's all. water. Water has been pumped out. Uh, I think the remaining of it was excuse me. It, it was there for several. Yeah, months. I understand. Yes, it was. It, there was a fence around it, but it was. I agree, it was definitely there for a long time. Not much of a fence. Okay. Thank you. Because Ed has also communicated with the building department how to handle these issues. And the building department does not have an answer at that point. So, but for us, you know, breaking the groundwater, that would be unauthoristic. That's why we're kind of forcing to be talking to the, talking to, you know, tiles and, and doing all that stuff to get water out from the pool. So. Larry. Uh, my concern is, is I will try to visualize this as all of you are discussing it. Um, and uh, due to no pictures with this and certainly no site visits, um, we could have even done a site visit had we known about it, you know, a few days ago, I realized I'd have to put this together. So I'm, I come away with really not understanding, understanding it at all. Uh, that's my, maybe that's my fault. So I'm simply going to abstain. I don't. Uh, I don't see. I understand there's a problem, and I understand people working on it, but um, I don't think uh, 
myself, and I can't speak for the other commissioners. I think we should have known more. <clears throat> Thank you, Larry, because this, this is kind of urgency along the way, and I don't know how, you know, what's the best way to communicate with the commission with this stuff, because we have to try and push it away and get what out from the pool, from the hole. We just get the stuff sent to us in some sort of uh, some, something more than just this. Uh, my position. Thank you. Any Is other question? Any other motion? Other motion? Time at this point? Is yeah. I'll make a motion. <clears throat> Cut off a motion to approve the enforcement order as written. <laughs> so moved. Second. Roll call. Foster. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. Hearns. Aye. Lee. Aye. Morin. Larry. Abstain. Uh, Abadili. Aye. And Sam Poo. Aye. Make motion carries. Thank you. Excuse me. Huh? Good luck, good luck, Charles. Work, work with Ed. Ed with the geotech guys and uh, keep Ed in the loop as far as what is the change, what is the update on the project stuff. We'll do. We'll do. We'll, we'll submit any report that we receive. Thank you. Yes. Um. I just want to mention. Um. Could commissioners please keep themselves muted at all times until they're ready to speak? Because there is background noise that Channel 18 is picking up, and that is why you're getting muted. So please remember that for the hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The third enforcement order is Alexander Fultman and Belena. I'm trying to pronounce this. It's I smoke. Hamby Tova. Hamatova and Milena Foman, 377 Neck Road, Sandville, mapped 233, parcel 044, failure to comply with ongoing conditions of a certificate of compliance, SE3 2918, and permitted alterations from the plan of record, leans to within the footprint of the dark structures and failure to remove seasonal floats at. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that pretty much says what it is. Um, there's a, a large dock structure that was permitted here, uh, the gangway, and then a float. Uh, the float was still in the water uh, as of earlier, earlier, or the last month. Um, and then there was also a small uh, leaky structure that was built here on this end of the of the permanent side of the dock. Uh, gives you the picture of what it was. This this uh, portion that had been built without permitting or of, of any sort. Um, the good news is that Miss um, uh, uh, <clears throat> Foman um, has uh, agreed. She actually sent to sent the um, sent me an email uh, earlier today. Uh, or earlier this week, saying that she was um, had read the enforcement order, she understood what it was, uh, and that she's going to be complying completely with the uh, enforcement order. So she'll be removing the uh, lean to structure uh, by the end of March, uh, depending upon getting her her contractor to do that, and um, also will be uh, removing the float on a seasonal basis from here on out to a, a, a location up an upland location so she's all set thank you wet any questions from the commission motions to approve the enforcement order as written so move so move second second okay no Foster. Hi. Gilmore. Hi. Hearn. Hi. Lee. Hi. Warren. Hi. Sample. Hi. That's unanimous. We have one enforcement or the response plans. Ogla, Sherman Yoke, and Trout Hill Realty Trust. 30 Lauren Drive, Marston Spill, Map 101, Puzzle 062, Restorations Plan Review, Enforcement or the Ratified at or at November the 1st, 2022 meeting for alteration of the buffer to a wetland resource area, but bordering vegetated wetland 
by placing hardscape rock within zero to between zero to uh, hundred buffer, not in compliance with the plan of the record of for SE three dash five eight one four at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, this is in response. You've already heard the enforcement order and ratified the enforcement order. Uh, this is the uh, culmination of that enforcement order. Uh, they were to, to do a uh, enforcement response plan, a prefer a restoration plan. Um, Andrew Garrelly uh, has uh, been working with the homeowner to do that work. Um, he had submitted the, the plan. You've gotten digital copies of it. Uh, some of you had uh, paper copies as well. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Andrew uh, walk you through it. Uh, he should be able to, to uh, share his screen, but if he's not, then I have it here as well. So uh, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Hi. Well, this is Andrew Garrelly, Resident Landscape Architect, Yamaha for Design Group. Um, I'm going to turn my screen on, hopefully, here. And where am I? Um, okay. Ah, I think I got it. Coming up. And we see again. Okay, I'm trying to get to the where I can zoom it in. The um the little plus then. You can go to plus yeah, it's behind the participant. A participant has enabled closed captioning, and so that's where my button is. So I couldn't get at it. Sorry. Um, the um, yeah. So as as um, I think we had I think we had pictures in the first um, the first go around. If not, I can share those as well. Um, so the the walkway and everything here and and patio everything. Uh, with that was part of the uh, permitted plan, as is the set of stairs that comes down here. Um, what was not part of the plan was they ran into a, a very nasty downpour thunderstorm um, about a year and a half ago, I think it was, that was causing a lot of erosion while this before this was stabilized. And the contractor suggested to the homeowner that putting rocks in along the edge of the stairs and on the slopes would alleviate that problem which it did but of course it was not permitted um i'm gonna have to zoom in again here now i can't get at the tabs here There we go. So um, what we're hoping to do is remove remove the stones except for just along the edge of the um, uh, stairs on both sides because everything kind of funnels down to the edge of it. And this is where there was the, the most erosion was going on when they made the decision to do this. Um, and I've, I'm not seeing any kind of washout or anything here after rainstorms. I've been there after rainstorms. So, and, and we're hoping to be able to remove all of the stone here on the slope. And this is all slope, by the way. So this is the edge, the top of a bank here. And this is a slope covered with rocks right now. This is all rocks as well. And the same over here. So what this plan is proposing to do is remove the rocks from here and then um, restabilize with um, a biodegradable coconut fiber erosion control blanket and plantings. Uh, the plantings will be low um, uh, creeping juniper, low bush blueberries. There are a couple of clethras in here where it's not so steep. Um, and the low bush blueberries is there's a, a little bit of a lack of sunlight right in that area. And uh, I wanted to vary it up as well a little bit. And then this would be creeping juniper to, to stabilize that. The homeowner, um, we haven't closed out the order of conditions yet. And her existing mitigation is shown here in green. Um, the proposed mitigation was of, um, I just have to look at my note here. Uh, the required mitigation at the time was 532 square feet and proposed was 553. Um, she has provided 860 
square feet currently. So what we're hoping to be able to do is leave that 18 inches of stone on both sides for the stabilization of it, remove the rest of the stones, and put erosion control blanket, and then plant these plants on it. Um, and, and then adding for that extra mitigation that she's already done, and then the uh, amount of uh, new plantings that would be on the slope um, would be um, enough to looking for my note over here, would be enough to um, make make up for the mitigation for what is not permitted along both sides of the steps. And I, I'm hoping you'll agree with me about the um, stone on the edge. Um, I'm going to try to change my screen here and show you. I just don't know if you if you, we had pictures before or not. So this is what that looks like. Um, did we have pictures last time or not? I'm not sure. We did. Yes. I I don't have them right. I can let me yeah. see if I can't get them. So, so pictures last time. Okay. Yeah. So you can see um, this would be cut down to about 18 inches on the sides here. All of this would be removed. Um, much of this in this corner here would be removed and this would be removed just because you can see it kind of funnels down. And I'm just right. really concerned if we take it all away, it's going to wind up bringing sediment down out here and right into the pond or lake, I should say. Um, and um, go back to that. Um, and and really, that's what I'm proposing to uh, for as a solution, and hoping that you would all agree with that. Um, Do you want to see the picture? I can show you some pictures if you want. I I'm going to get uh, remove your your uh, screen sharing, Andrew. If it's okay. Yeah, yeah I think that's uh, yes. Let's show the pictures. The question I have for Ed, Ed when you're looking at this plan, are you okay? With this one. I am. I do. I, I am. I was going to talk to Andrew. I, I've got a personal beef against the uh, creeping juniper, <laughs> so yeah. I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about the, something different other, other than uh, creeping juniper. But uh, other than that, I, I support the plan. Uh, I think it's a good idea to leave the area uh, here uh, to help uh, reduce any any erosion issues that would be coming down. The, the I think the way the the um, the walkway was was constructed it would if you didn't have it there it would it would probably lend itself to more erosion that way so um if i could make a comment about the creeping juniper the reason why i chose it is because it's very flat on the ground and i'm seeing it to cover the soil and reduce erosion that way As i feel like if i use an upright shrub the only thing that's making that's on the surface is just the, the roots underneath the surface so that the the intent here is to blanket the surface to slow down the water movement and avoid the erosion that's why that is uh, my choice that I, I don't have an issue with it. I, I think it's just like i'd like to see something else in addition to yeah to add a little bit more vertical structure sure Darcy, do you have any comment Oh, thank you, Tom. I, I just said I would talk to Ed to make sure that any of the extra rocks that we're allowing or hardscape on either side of the steps were included in the mitigation calculations, and it sounds like it is. Yeah. Thank you, Dusty. Yeah, I was just going to say I do agree. It was steep to the slope and the design of those stairs that I think we need a, a small border. Those stones there would be a good idea. Otherwise, you will get erosion along the edge of that stairway, which will eventually end up in the pond. I think, right. I think it's a good plan. John? Um, yeah, the, the, the one concern that jumps out, obviously, is that, that we've been fairly consistent in, in the design of those kinds of steps. So uh, I think we need to make it clear that there's something unique or different uh, at the specific site where we are now allowing a variation from what we normally do. And maybe George just did that. That's all, but I think we need to be clear on that. No, I agree with you in the sense that I think it's site specific as far as what the design is for the stay, but in this case, 
you know, you you slope along the stairway quite steep, and trying to minimize that, you need to have some kind of rock to stabilize the soil area. So, right. so yes, and I actually also have an agreement with that juniper, but um, more than erosion from land runoff, that creeping juniper uh, impedes raindrop initiated erosion. So something like that is helpful. Um, but as you had suggested, add something else in addition to that, or is there another evergreen that serves as a robust uh, interceptor of rain besides the juniper? Yeah, I, I think I think it would be best to, to add add to it, uh, or you know, I, I, again, I I would defer to Andrew if he could come up with some alternative. Uh, would do the same same function and add a little bit more uh, height diversity. Uh, you know, I, I would encourage that too. But I, I would I'd like to see uh, at least a little bit of, of addition additional plants of, of something else other than the creeping juniper. You know, they can leave some of that again because, as you said, it does uh, it does reduce the rain rain initiated erosion. So. Okay, yeah, it's not a new issue or anything like that. It was just purely functional. So right. there's no is it not going to be an issue from the homeowner whatever plants we want to put in there so is that something i can work with with the staff um to make an adjustment on the plan so we don't have to continue or is that something that i need to revise the plan and bring back no i think you can uh, work with ed or even Dante to make any additional changes in terms of the planting mm -hmm. and then you can just submit a revised plan with that that's so i would say Larry. And let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I think you gave an incredibly good description of the erosion patterns and issues. Um, I, I, it'd be nice to have the your plan back up. But let's just talk about uh, the right side of the steps going down, which is the north side, uh, and the left side is the south side. Uh, but you, you, I, I. I think I understood you to say that the erosion force was stronger from the north side or the right side than it is on the left side. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so because there there was um, it, it's quite steep here, and it it was already this the topography was already kind of funneled that way. You can see all the contour lines. It, it's kind of a semicircle this way. Um, so every everything was coming this way and this way. It was beforehand as well. Um, and here the the water movement is more evenly toward the the slope this way. So it's so more gra it's more gradual on the south or left side. Uh, and then, but the right side. Have you given thought to what happens if the erosion or the force of the water coming down remains strong and and the 18 inches might not be enough. I'm just looking at that north side and thinking the way it's the way it's it looks good, but it, it seems to be not not of great concern. I would be more inclined to support uh, more stone or, or it could be shrubs. The other question I had for you is whether creeping juniper has a deep root system and whether the roots are on the surface, because to me that would have some bearing on it. Um, uh, but if it comes back that uh, heavy rains or anything called brings the erosion back. Uh, then we're back in here again to restore it. So I'm more inclined to support stronger um, stones or or methods by which the erosion is is directed away, uh, so that it doesn't return on the north side. Than I am worried about the south side. That's that's how I'm interpreting it. How do you I'm react to that, Andrew? Standing on the ground and looking at that on the north side of the walkway, I'm very comfortable that the 18 inches will work. Okay. Yeah, because it's 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 really the the funneling really happens right up and in, into here. Maybe I should show the uh, picture one of the pictures again. Let's see if I can find something looking up from the bottom. Yeah, this is right where it gets wider right here. So you your, can see it, your it, pictures it, are coming up, Andrew. They're not coming up. Okay, you have to get rid. I think you have to get rid of the one and switch switch your screen. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm going to stop sharing and then redo it here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you see it now? Yep. Yes, you've got some, you've got some, the barrels there with flowers in they, it. Is, they, is, they, that, they is, that the, is that where the force hits it? Yeah, okay. This is a picture before, so okay. you can kind of see how it all kind of funneled down. Yeah, it's, it's, steep, it's steep there too. Yeah. yeah. So this is afterwards, and it, it really, it seems to me that the water is already here, and it's not really coming here. Right. I think it's already on the edge, so I, I'm, I'm not worried about removing those stones um, to the left. But if and the indication that I got from the first meeting was that the commission really didn't want to have any stones, so that's why. I mean, if if I had it my way for erosion reasons, I'd leave m more of it. But I understand, you know, it, it's it's coverage in. A buffer, so you know it, it's it, it's um, your call on it. I mean, she would be happier to not have to pay to have all of this removed um, and and restabilize it. But um, you know, we need to comply with the commission, and I I think the rest of the commission is not in strong support of leaving more stones. But um, well, well, we well, I am, more. I am, Andrew. And I'm looking at the top up there where those plants are. And I, mm -hmm. I, I would be comfortable having, uh, say, 24 inches and then taper down to where the water goes, have it there to, to, intercept, to intercept the force of the water. Um, and then hopefully as it goes down the bank further, uh, stones aren't needed or there can be minimal if, it, if at all. But that's how I look at it. And I didn't look at the property. I wasn't the property once. I looked at it and I could see what the issue was from above. But I didn't walk down the steps to look up. I think the view looking up is much more significant and more yeah. revealing. So uh, I'm I'm in support of, of of your preference and hope that it can be uh, more than reducing it as it is. But uh, I've been in the minority before. Thank, Thank you. you, Yeah, Andrew. I think you said earlier that you'd be comfortable with the 18 inches. And I look at it, and I would be very comfortable. Also, uh, from a contractor's point of view, I I, I think when, once you you put down that that matting and get it planted and get the plants to take take hold, I think you're in good shape there. Yeah, I I think the, the water's already on this edge by the time we get here. Right, is is how it looks to me on the site. So th this is not the, nothing's coming here. Just, just what lands there is coming there. So, right. and and no, because you because, because you're going to is going towards the stairway and going down to the edge along the stairway. So yes, yes. And, and the same, the same here is it's um, this is not we're not generating speed with water here until we get to the edge, right. um, and of course that would be stabilized with that. But it's th this water is spread out. It's not concentrated like it is. Um, you know, there's a little bit of concentration here, but there's not concentration there. The other concentration's here. Right. Right. Yeah. Bill? Bill? Unmute yourself, Bill. Yeah. Um, sorry. I, I have a iPad here that's going to run out very quickly so i'm trying to save uh, energy by not having the screen on um less stone is 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 where i'm coming from uh and i thought that the project that he brought in this evening was a good one and i was supportive of of what he was presenting i am not in favor of more stone that's all thank you bill ed I uh, can. I'm just going to agree with with uh, with what Bill and George were saying. Is like I think the the project as pre presented uh, handles everything that we had asked to do. We were very specific about having having them remove at the, at the enforcement hearing, uh, having them to remove all of this uh, extra 
uh, rack, uh, rocks and and, uh, and boulders here. So I think the, the plan as he's presented is uh, more than sufficient to handle the, the rain that's coming or the, the uh, potential water that's coming down along the edge of the of the um, steps. And I would encourage the, the removal of the rocks uh, and go and, and as, as it is uh, as it is currently being proposed. So that's all I have. Thank you, Ed. Could I have a motion to approve the planting plan as submitted and adding some additional planting and uh, working with Ash to finalize that, and then you can submit the revised plan for that. So moved. Aye. Roll call. Abadili. Aye. Foster. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Lee. Aye. Warren. Accept. Uh, Sam Poo. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Work with Ed. Thank you. We have two RDA. The first one is Pamela Wright. Item. Installation of a split rail fence along portions of the common lot line with 105 Eel River Road as 117 Eel River Road as long as the SSS 116 Parcel 097. Arlene. Good evening. Arlene Wilson and Wilson Associates here for the and um, I think this is a, a reasonably simple project. She wants to install um, a split rail fence along the common property line with her southerly abutter. Um, some of it is in uh, the buffer zone, but it's going to be heavily planted on both sides, both as a result of the order that you uh, have given to the abutter and the order that we have for Mrs. Randon's boathouse, as you may recall. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. We are not asking for the commission to confirm any resource areas that are shown on this plan. This is just the only plan that we could find that showed the whole property. Um, so on this application, we are only dealing with the split ale fence. That's well. correct. Yeah. Any question for the commissioner? Any public comment, Joe Keen? Seeing none. Could I have a motion to approve this project as a negative determination? So moved. Second. Roll call. Morning. Aye. Foster. Aye. Sampo. Aye. Abadili. Aye. Gilmore, aye. Lee. Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. The second idea is Joseph T. Marathon. Construct 14 by 18 dining room additions at 73 Cranberry Lane, San Diego, as long as the assessment 246, parcel 180. Start. Hello. Is this yes. Can you hear me? You want to? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. And see the plan too. Yes. Um. So let's see. I got to get myself oriented here. So yeah. So uh, they need a they need a dining room. Um. And we are staying as well as far away from the wetlands as absolute possible. You can see. Uh, most, you know, obviously his property, very strange lot, goes over the road and in towards the old bog. Um, and this was really, I don't know if anybody visited the lot, the only place, he doesn't have the, uh, the room on the right-hand side of the property, obviously. Uh, we tried to keep it back as far as we could on the left-hand side of the property. Um, and uh yeah that's really the the only spot that it worked for the uh, layout of the inside of the house as well excuse me but that, we're talking about an isolated uh, vegetated wetlands that's what the jurisdiction is correct yes yes okay that's what i thought thank you yeah so any other questions he's, he's 84 feet uh right. from the closest right. point you know thank you any other question from the commissioner? Chen Wiki, any comment on this? 
Seeing none. Can I have a motion to approve this project as a negative determination? I move. Second. We'll call. Yeah. Aye. Foster. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Lee. Aye. Morin. Aye. Sampu. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. All right. Thank you, guys. Good night. We have one continuance. It's Homeport Investments, LLC, proposed replacement of existing felling timber bulkhead. A vinyl bulkhead at 9 Indian Trail, Austin, as soon as the map 091 puzzle 015. This continuance from January 31st, waiting for the DEP numbers. And we find, oh, and the forum is everyone except Bill. And we have received the DEP number as SE3. S six zero six five. Could I have a motion to close the public hearing and authorize the staff to issue the order condition? So moved. Second. 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 Roll call. Shampoo. Aye. Warren. Aye. Lee. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. Foster. Aye. Abadir. Aye. That's unanimous. Our next hearing is February the fourteenth at six thirty. Could I have a motion? Adjourned. Second. Roll call. Abadili. Aye. Foster. Aye. Gilmore. Aye. Hearn. Aye. Lee. Aye. Morin. Aye. Temple. Aye. That's unanimous. We are adjourned at 501. Thank you.